Perfect. Well, thank you all for joining us here tonight. Um, just a few housekeeping items. I do have everyone except for our panelists muted here. Um, if you have a question, I have some prepared, but if you have a question, you can put it into the chat and I will ask it of the group. Um, if you look at the toolbar, it is the, you can hit the little um, chat mm -hmm. icon and then um, type that in and we will pass that along. Same thing if you are streaming on Facebook, um, you can type a question in there and our moderator on Facebook, Dave Beck, will relay it over here. So. Thank you again for spending your evening with us and joining us on our um, final panel for Art and Design Week. Um, we have our panelists here. Everyone made it, yay. Um, <laughs> and so I'm actually going to have them start by introducing themselves. Um, just a little bit about what your background is, um, what you've been doing basically since graduation to this point, what, what sort of work you do, uh, big picture. Um, and I'll start with Eric. Hi, I'm Eric. Um, I graduated in end of 2014, 2015 uh, with a BFA in graphic design and a minor in applied photography. Since graduation, I've had a full-time job doing uh, media marketing for a performance car shop in the Twin Cities. Uh, they kind of specialize in aftermarket car parts for uh, turbo four-cylinder vehicles, if anybody understands that. Um, and then also doing 20 plus 40 hours a week of freelance on the side, so. Then we'll pass it to Carolyn. Uh, hi, I'm Carolyn. I graduated in 1991 uh, with a BFA in graphic design. For the first nine years or so, I worked at a couple of agencies uh, in Minneapolis uh, and also at an ad agency in Dallas. Uh, after those nine years, I went freelance and I've been freelance for about 19 years now. A lot of my clients are print, uh, highly technical, so medical, manufacturing and finance. Um, I've also released a typeface and then a couple years ago released a book. And then let's go to Cody. Hi there. Uh, my name is Cody Pitts. I uh, graduated in uh, 2013. Uh, with a BFA in multimedia design, uh, but I do primarily graphic design. Uh, I went on to work at uh, Duffy and Partners for roughly three and a half years, uh, doing primarily branding and packaging. Uh, then I went to Little and Company uh, for about a year and a half, and then I left there to do uh, full-time freelance for about the last year and a half. And yeah. Last but not least, we'll end with Mike. Thanks. Oh, I'm glad I'm not least. Thanks. <laughs> um, so yeah, Mike Owens, I'm an animation director. Um, I graduated. I didn't graduate from Stout or anything. I graduated from Columbia College in Chicago in 96, um, where I started working. I uh, had a full-time job out of school working on Animaniacs. Uh, when that dried up, it was freelance up until I moved to Minnesota. Uh, in 2003, um, and then I got a job as an animation director at a place called Puny Entertainment in Minneapolis, um, where I got to have, uh, we built and developed uh, Danger and Eggs, a show I have on Amazon. Um, and since leaving Puny, uh, I started a company with my wife, Wendy, doing animation um, out of our home. Um, so balancing freelance skills and everything else I learned along the way. Um, so I think the biggest question when I've done these sort of either workshops or panels that people want to know, like, how do you even get started building a client base, making it out on your own, which is a really big question. Yeah. <laughs> um, we'll start with Mike since we ended with you last time. Oh, all right, cool. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, a lot of that who, you know, thing definitely, I've got all my jobs word of mouth. I think I've had two interviews in my 20 plus year career. Um, so when you get, if there's an opportunity to work on a real project, do it even if it's not exactly what you want to do. Um, but being a part of a production, um, that crew will know you. And as long as you're not a terrible person and you do halfway decent work, um, 
people will remember you. Um, and I'm not even necessarily do things for free. You can at the very early, but cut that habit out as early as possible. Like even minimum wage for anything, people are still getting a deal from you. So just sort of learning like your value right off the bat. Um, but it really like the whole networking thing, whether it means like, which we can't do now is go in a room and shake hands and everything. Um, but just staying, keeping those connections, following up, um, it's relationship building as much as your skill building in your craft. Um, Eric, do you want to go? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think Mike kind of nailed it on the head. Um, I actually answer all these questions on paper because I can't freestyle any of this kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I just said kind of talking to anyone and everyone who will listen about what you do. Um, whether it's getting your tires rotated or whatever, um, just exactly that networking word of mouth and meeting people a lot of, like, yeah, a lot of stuff we can't be doing right now. Um, I grew most of my, uh, client base pretty much through social media, which has been just crazy huge as of recent, obviously. Um, yeah. And then working, you know, right when you start out working for friends and family for, little money as much as it stinks it helps you get a portfolio and helps you get um a little circle going and then yeah word of mouth from there just stems out um anything to add carolyn or cody uh yeah so like uh kind of reiterating what eric said like social media was kind of a big part of how i gained um a pretty good client base but then also um some of my best clients actually came from personal projects. Um, I would just create kind of random stuff that I wanted to do and kind of bring in work that I wanted to do through that kind of means. So I would create just like little packages of like little, uh, like little whiskey kits. And I threw that up on Dribbble and I got uh, a project for a whiskey kit through that project. And it like bloomed to be one of my best reoccurring projects. So. I would reiterate, yeah, like it's about who you know. It's about like getting out there, getting your work out there, especially through social media and maybe try to do a little bit more personal work as well to um, expand yourself if you don't quite have a client base yet. Um, we have a question from Facebook. Uh, Justin wants to know, and this is more for our graphic designers, um, what are the benefits and downfalls of moving into um, digital UX from print graphic design? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, obviously there's benefits of both. I think with digital, there's maybe a little bit more stability uh, on average uh, with obviously like the digital age, like exploding, uh, I feel like you're a little bit more stable if you're to going to pursue uh, something in more UX uh, or at least having a skill set in UX is very important nowadays. Uh, I won't say that you need to learn how to code, but uh, at least being able to make proper wireframes and uh, know how to design for the web, at least know the language to speak to, because you'll be working, more likely you'll be working with people on maybe website updates uh, if you're going to go into an agency first before you're doing freelance. Uh, so, and a lot of my clients ask for website um, updates here and there. So luckily at Stout, I took a few web courses just because I had a feeling that they would be important later on. Uh, and uh, yeah, that became you know, kind of paramount with some of my more recent clients asking for those services. I think trust is really important. The, the, I was working with a client print for years and then they needed an iPad app. Well, I had never done one before. They had never done one before either, but we'd worked together long enough that they said, I trust that you'll be able to figure it out and make this work. But that was really a leap of faith based on years of years of trust. So if you have a way to prove to them that you can make that leap and prove to them maybe with portfolio samples or something that you just did on your own, that might be a good way to make that shift from traditional graphic design to UX. Yeah. Um. 
kind of along those lines, what has been the biggest challenge to having a freelance career and what have been the biggest benefits? And I think this ties in a little bit to the situation that we currently all find ourselves in. <laughs> um, we can start with Carolyn, yeah. Yeah, so wearing, you just have to wear so many hats when you're freelancing. You have mm -hmm. to be able to estimate a job and bill a job and you have to know when sales tax is applicable or not applicable and you have to work with print vendors or other vendors and you just have to be nimble enough and experienced enough to be able to wear all those different hats successfully and it can be stressful and it can I think take a couple of years to feel really confident that you can do that so that is the biggest challenge but ultimately, you have so much more flexibility than you have when you're working for anybody else. And that is, um, that flexibility really, really means a lot, both financially and who you choose to work for and what kinds of projects you can work on. Um, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I think I, think I uh, yeah, I think flexibility is a huge one. Um, the biggest challenge I think for me on a personal level is kind of being your own boss um, <laughs> there's nobody else there to yell at you when you're slacking off so you kind of have to yell at yourself and, uh, yeah along those lines uh, money management too has been kind of difficult for me uh, you can go freelancing and make ten thousand dollars a month and then the next month you can make zero dollars and the previous month you have to plan ahead for that and be ready for it which can be pretty tricky if you get a big check you're like awesome and you go spend it all on new gear or whatever and now it's gone and you're broke the next month so um cody or mike do you have anything else to add uh i mean it's all the the wearing many hats the um thinking of business the you know, it's, you get into it and, and we like, I, I wasted a lot of money and time early on in my career. Cause I didn't study super basic business, balancing my money when I'm paying taxes, all those things, because you do have to be every person in the company. Um, and we are definitely in, in like, I've existed almost entirely on remote working. Um, my show was not, I didn't move to LA to do my show. I did it in St. Paul. Um, and it was done with people in LA and South Korea. So like the, the fat, but, but in order to have that luxury, you have to, no one is gonna cover your health insurance. No one's gonna make sure you're saving money. So having a base knowledge of money management and business management, um, as much as you like learn how to do, make beautiful art, they have to go hand in hand because you can't have one without the other. You can have all business and nothing pretty to look at because you're not drawing enough or you can just draw all the time, but like waste your money as soon as you get it. So it's a constant balance you have to find. Um, along those lines, a question from Facebook, um, what was your learning curve for charging clients um, per hour, per project? How did you figure that out? I think it's kind of a constant thing. It's, it's <laughs> always evolving. Um, <laughs> Uh, oh gosh, how do I explain this? So uh, I'm kind of still running into this right now. It's like, okay, what uh, does this project kind of lean more toward an hourly basis or is this more of a per project basis? Um, I do photography as well as graphic design and uh, I find those photography projects get to kind of lean more into the hourly side because you don't really know how long a photo shoot's gonna go sometimes. Um, you don't really know how long editing's gonna quite take. So it's like, okay, I can't quite put a number to those estimated hours that I don't know yet. So that's when I'll throw on an hourly um, uh, estimate. But for per project basis, if it's something I'm more familiar with, with packaging, um, I can be like, okay, we're doing a, a pouch system for a food client. I, I can, I've already done this project kind of before. I know how long like those hours will take. So I can kind of say, okay, um, this is more of a standard rate project. I've kept pretty detailed records on types of projects and how long they've taken. So with that data, when a client comes to me and says, I need a 
24 page report that's going to include a lot of scientific and technical information uh, and is going to require photos, whatever, whatever those input elements are, I can go back to that record and say, okay, when I've worked on similar kinds of projects, they've taken this amount of time. And then I can use that as data to tell the client what I think they should expect for the project. But it takes a long time to build up that kind of data. And until then, it's just kind of guessing. <laughs> yeah. Can, can I jump in on that yeah. one? Um, yeah, uh, Carolyn, you're, you're spot on with all of that. Um, is to track, your, learn to track your time, because you have to learn how to quantify your time and your skill. And it's, it's a thing you don't know until you do it, <laughs> I guess, and maybe fail at it a couple of times and, you know, burn, you know, do too much work for too little money, whatever, make those mistakes. Um, but so because people like for what we do people say i want to do some animation and a lot of times people have not even a close idea of the scope of what that means because like it's a lot of people's they just want to they want a pixar movie um you can just do that right it's all computer whatever it might be because you have to educate sort of clients along the way but i understand the feeling to like i don't feel like i can charge so much because i still don't know that much i'm still learning like so it is, it's a gradual learning process and it's getting into the habit of like Carolyn's saying is to quantify and track your production and your costs so that you do know how much your time is worth. Um, and it will be ever evolving because you'll be getting better. And it's that whole, and that comes around to is like, I do not charge hourly anymore. I did early in my career because I was learning. So I think that's fine. But now I get punished because I can do things faster because I'm better. But now if I'm charging hourly, I'm getting less money for being better. <laughs> so I've moved over to weekly rates and daily rates because I, can, I know how much I can accomplish in a day. I know how much I can accomplish in a week. Um, but that took a long time to figure that out. Um, kind of a, a related question. Are there um, resources that you basically use to learn about the business side of things or things you outsource to other people? Like I cannot do my own accounting or taxes. How do you handle those sort of things or learn about them? I'll give a shout out to AIGA, AIGA.org. Uh, slash standard hyphen agreement and I can put that in the comments that is a great starting point for a contract that a graphic designer could use for freelance work uh, and I there are plenty of other resources on the AI, AIGA site but that standard agreement uh, is a great starting point I'll, and I'll type that here uh, for any photo or video people out there I use uh, what's called PPA um, it's awesome. You can get insurance and they have a bunch of resources for like base contracts and stuff like that for photo shoots. Um, and it's just a really great resource. They have a ton of stuff on copyright and I think it's pretty similar to AIGA type stuff. They just also offer insurance for, uh, photo shoots and photo equipment, uh, computers and stuff like that. If it's above and beyond what you already pay for, um, like renter's insurance, sometimes it's covered in that. So that's a good one too. I don't have any super good resources. I've mostly been in a lot of trial by fire, learn from falling on my face kind of stuff. Um, but the idea of when I said about like getting into a production of any sort at any angle, if you can get into like a production management or finance, but you do that as well. Um, even if it's not even in your field, like my wife early, early in her working career, like still in, uh, just getting out of high school, worked in some sort of accounting scenario. So like using a spreadsheet made sense. And so just having that kind of knowledge of to organize numbers and um, write contracts, which I believe we talk about in a little bit. Um, but I wish I had better resources earlier on. Um, animation's a little weird where there's uh, unless you live in LA where they have a union for you, there's less of a nationwide sort of support system. 
think one thing I've been, uh, oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, one thing I've been using is uh, uh, luckily I've been fortunate to utilize a, a separate person for my taxes. Uh, they handle a lot of that stuff for me. Um, I realize that I, it, I'm not quite at that point yet where I can uh, quite get all my information organized correctly. Uh, so that's been a big help uh, just to be like, okay, I can focus on my work and have, you know, this resource. But uh, luckily I built up to that point now. Um, but there's also a book that I've been using for kind of some inspiration with uh, uh, the business side of things. And that's the uh, Hood Spa freelance book. I got to snag it from my bookshelf one second. <laughs> I think I have the same book. Oh, here we go. So uh, this is the uh, freelance yeah. and business and stuff book <laughs> from Hutzpah. Um, it's a great resource um, and it's really easily digestible for business or freelancers. Whereas like a lot of books where it's just like this big and it'll have like very, you know, intense terms in there. But this one's pretty thin, pretty easily like, you know, kind of like starting out. Uh, I would highly recommend this. So I'll put a link in there. Um, so we started touching upon it. Um, just a reminder, if you do have a question, um, you can type it into the chat and I will ask it. Um, but contracts and basically, how did you set up your contract? I, I use the AIJ.org their standard agreement as a starting point and then i customized it and, and i continue to refine it so as um a problem comes up a lesson learned i'll change the contract so then i don't have to deal with it again <laughs> but the aiga contract is a, is a good place to start Yeah, a base contract. I, I remember just searching online, but finding enough of a base contract, so there are resources and keeping it as simple at first to start with, because there you can get when you receive a contract, a lot of times they're multi pages and there's a lot of stuff to read. It almost come to it with your own contract. Um, if you're if you can with a project, it's a lot of some people don't want to use your contract, but I like I started out very simple um, as the business progressed um i did have access to a lawyer that would like i would he would write one for me and then until i understood how to here's what i wanted to say he would put the proper language in it and like it's an investment on my part to pay for that service but it's not like an on retainer lawyer it's like a couple hundred bucks that might save me ten thousand bucks down the line or you know just getting screwed in a way that i can't get out of um, so it's, it's balancing those kind of expenses, but going to the people who are the experts, if you can, um, is great, but just until you get to that point, start very simple. And like Carolyn said, learn from your mistakes. Um, what sort of business format are you set up as like, are you an LLC, that sort of thing? I'm an LLC, it's super easy. Can you explain for the students what an LLC is? Uh, limited liability company. So if something baseline, if something goes terrible with the company and someone wants to sue me, they can't go after my personal assets. So I'm an entity outside of my personal assets. Um, so it's a, it's a protection for yourself for the most part, makes you look super legit because you are. Um, and it's not that expensive or hard. Um, you can do it online. I'm an S corp and I, there, there are, there are some downsides to that. It requires a little bit more paperwork um, that I hire my um, accountant to do. The benefit to that though, is I'm able to put more money away for retirement as an S corp. Um, I can go. I have, I actually have both. Well, no, I have an LLC. I have two LLCs and a sole proprietorship which please don't ask me what the difference is because I will not give you a smart answer. <laughs> and uh, I'm an LLC as well. 
Um, there are perks and ups and downs, um, but do one um, because then you're not just a person in their basement doing art. You're a business. Um, it does. It's it it's it changes a lot of things. It's more paperwork along the way, but um, the more professionally you're presented into the world, uh, the better relationships you can have with clients. Sure. Um, we have a question, I believe from Facebook. Um, can you talk about your home studio and office and what routines do you have that make you successful? Uh, I, I can go. Um, so, <laughs> um, I've got like a little small wooden desk here. Um, nothing too fancy. Uh, but in terms of just routine and kind of how you keep yourself motivated, obviously with having the freedom of being your own boss, um, uh, I like to kind of get out there into like coffee shops. Um, I used to go to like my local gym. Uh, they had like a, a Wi-Fi area that you could just work out of, but at least kind of getting out into a space. Obviously we kind of can't do that right now, but uh, a lot of things that people do is try to dress a little nicer, even though that you have the ability to be kind of scrubby, uh, try to dress as if you were going into work every day so that, um, you had kind of have that mindset going into it where like, you're not just going to sit on the computer and go down YouTube, like for a couple hours and then sit on the couch. Like you're like, okay, I'm ready. I'm focused. Let's get this going. I definitely agree with Cody. Um, I think finding a good way to separate work and home is really important. Um, I'm currently fortunate enough to have kind of a two bedroom setup where I have an office and a living room and then a bedroom, but I have been in, tiny studios where you're forced to look at your work computer while you're eating, living, sleeping, whatever. And it's, it is super difficult because it, you associate it with work and you're trying to relax. So, I mean, even if it's like a, one of those divider things to kind of hide your workspace, or if it's a, if it's a mobile workspace, you can put it away and hide it. Just don't have it out on your, on your coffee table while you're watching movies and stuff like that. I think it's, like I said, super important to find a way to separate that. Like uh, Cody said, if it's going to a coffee shop, I think that helps a ton too, if you are mobile. I work out of a home office and I have a, I have actually a normal size bedroom for my office. And then I have a tiny, tiny bedroom just for storage. And what's good about that. Yeah. At the end of the day, I can shut the door. I also have, separate phone lines specifically for the office and home and personal. That way clients can't call me on evenings and weekends. Um, but then also family knows they don't call me at work on my work line unless it's some kind of emergency. Um, and that's really helped to separate work and life, which I think is also a, a question somebody asked on Facebook. Yeah, it can be, if it can't be physical, it needs to be mental. <laughs> uh, if you don't have, if you're not fortunate enough to have the space. I mean, we fortunate enough do, we bought a house that nobody wanted because it was old and big, but it allowed for a space. Um, and then being a, essentially a business, but we're kind of still just freelancers, uh, our overhead is so low. Um, Cause that's the thing is as a freelancer, you can, and as an LLC, you can, when it comes to tax time, there's a percentage of your space that you can get a deduction for. Um, and that I didn't know that until I went to, uh, Fox tax that is very good working with artists, um, in Minneapolis, um, because there's all kinds of, like, I paid more taxes when I was a freelancer than I, you know, back in the day than I do now. Cause I was dumb and I didn't know what I was doing, uh, as much. Um, but yeah, it's, but if you, if you just have to have the mental space, um, I agree with the idea of like, even though. I, this is how I dress when I did go to work. I didn't, wherever I work in a place that I needed to uh, do artwork as a profession, you're kind of supposed to look the part, I guess. So you don't have to wear a tie. Um, but uh, having some, having ritual in your life um, is necessary. Uh, like I get up, make coffee, uh, play with the dog for five minutes, um, answer emails, uh, put, you know, it's, it's a thing called time blocking, even on your calendar, you got to res respect your own time. Like for three hours, I'm going to do production work for one hour this day a week. I'm going to do administrative work. Um, make sure again, have value to your own time and not just giving away your time to clients. 
I also had a client for years who he would call me at like 801 to talk about work. And he always seemed so surprised that I was actually in the office, <laughs> but he eventually learned, yeah, I was taking this seriously and I was showing up and I was treating it like a real job. And then he stopped calling it. I think he just trusted that I was going to be there working for him. Mm, yeah. You can get taken advantage of real quick if you don't set your parameters in a respectful way. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we've kind of touched on it with like the first question about building your clients client base and a couple other things has come up, but how has the uh, recent COVID-19 situation impacted your work? Not at all, honestly, for me, um, because of having the home studio, um, we've, since we started the company, cause I was just freelancing when my wife was working at the science museum until we decided to become full-fledged company, which was two years ago. We've been doing this for two years, like building our client base, setting up projects, um, because I've established myself as a remote production studio that I can work from anywhere. So it kind of was already my lifestyle in many ways. And I think there's, there's a, definitely a community and culture of that, that you know might be able to weather this storm better than others, fortunately. We're lucky in that regard. Cause I've never worked at a giant place. I'm so used to like uh, having some control over all of that. Um, so it's in my clients, like things have been delayed uh, maybe a couple weeks, but things are going on. So I don't know if that's how it's working for everybody. I just, I did a lot of leg work, not knowing this was coming of course, but for two years of just building relationships and taking on projects and now they're happening. And then people are just settling, letting the dust settle give, you know, it might start two weeks later, but we're still doing it. I had a client who laid off all their employees last Friday. Um, so there's, they still have design needs, but at the moment it's on hold. I think they just need to figure out what's going on because they still need to communicate with their customers. Um, I have another customer who's actually going to be sending me work this evening. They're having to refigure a whole bunch of things out to work remotely. So they need uh, quick and immediate help on things. Um, and I have other clients that I think they just haven't figured out how this is impacting them yet. And we just have to be nimble um, and ready to support them however they need support. Yeah, it's been pretty similar. Uh on my end. Uh, I had a lot of uh, potential new clients and a lot of proposals that were out there before the situation hit and all those went ghost, they all went dark. Uh, understandably, I'm sure everybody's dealing with this, you know, in their own way. Um, but uh, luckily I've had some retainer clients that still um, need work done and since some of them are in the food and beverage sector, you know, their sales are pretty similar to where they were so they still need work. However, um, we're dealing with a lot of new challenges with, okay, well, can we do these certain things for cheaper? Like, can we move product a little faster? Uh, so it's been, it's been interesting. And, it, and like kind of how uh, Mike was saying, like it hasn't really affected, uh, you know, my workflow in terms of, you know, sure I can't go to the coffee shop, but you know, I still have a workspace at home. So that really hasn't affected me too much. For me, the, my full-time job, I'm a non-essential employee, which is fun. <laughs> um, so I'm stuck working, well not stuck, fortunate enough to be able to work from home. Um, so doing that for the full-time nine to five. Uh, and then yeah, just shooting as far as photo and video stuff, uh, shooting has kind of been on hold. So just hunkering down and in editing mode, which is also a pretty fortunate situation that people in our profession are able to do that. I think remembering that we, we are all like communication and storytellers are super important right now. Um, not just, we're beyond just entertainment, although that's necessary. There's a lot of messaging that needs to go out and, um, and yeah, we might be taking lesser uh, rates for some things, um, but value comes in more than money. Um, especially in situations like this. And so if you have these relationships, 
and you're helping someone else, like, yeah, I'll do that for like 75% less or whatever, um, but it's going to help something on your end. We're kind of in a, everyone's got to look out for each other at the moment, but we're not around each other. It's very, uh, but there's this culture, this online culture that um, can really work in our favor. Like whether it's in this field or just in general, like as all the bad things you can say about social media or tweeting or Facebook, like it's also what you do with it. Um, and I think it's, uh, yeah, a challenge for everybody for sure. We might have a little bit of luxury because we have a home studio. Um, a bit of a question change, but we Dua from Facebook wants to know, how do you deal with failure and um, how do you move forward with your career? Jump right in. <laughs> Part of it, failure is uh, failure and persistence is like my new uh, mantra um, to be doing this for this long. Like failure is how you learn a lot of stuff. I mean, yes, it can be painful, but um, you just get up and take smaller steps, but you keep going forward. Um, if it's really what you want to do, it's a lot of work. And if it's really like your passion to do it, you'll figure it out. Um, uh, but just be cool with, be comfortable with failure, honestly. Uh, it's just part of the, it's like your drawings, like I always have art teachers and I've heard this a lot, you have 10,000 bad drawings in you, get them out and then you'll be really good. Um, but you're not gonna know that until you start. And I think every project you can reflect on and learn something from, and you might be really hard on yourself and Think it's a failure but your client might be really happy so it, it depends on who is de who is defining failure and who are you letting define failure but you can learn from every single project for sure yeah i think uh carolyn pretty much nailed it on the head with that one it depends on how you define failure like she said a lot of times um the client will be happy and you won't be happy. I think for me, that's more often true than the the opposite of that. So it's, you know, just internalizing it and figuring out why you defined it yourself as a failure and how you can kind of move forward from that. Um, if the client deems it a failure, then I think it's a kind of case by case basis. It, it can depend or vary greatly on what their perspectives are and stuff like that, if that makes sense. Yeah, and if a client de deems something a failure, then you just be really honest and have a conversation with them to identify what the issue was and try to resolve the situation from there. Every, every project's going to be different. I think that's a big thing is a lot of times when you're dealing with failure, especially with uh, client feedback, you know, you might, they might just say like, oh, we hate it. It's like, okay, well, you're going to feel like crap, but you got to be like, oh, well, okay, why do you hate it? Like, can we nail down some of those things to be like, okay, well, we can approve on this little thing or if they hate, you know, the color blue because they just don't like blue. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's adjust that. Like, you didn't know that information before and now you do. So, like, it's all about trying to, like, you know, be calm and uh, learn from the situation. Uh, we have a question from Lindsay here, kind of jumping back to the compensation conversation. Um, when you haven't really charged people for things before, how do you start that initial, this is what my wage is worth? And then um, basically, how do you, uh, what rate do you increase your wage as you grow in skill? I'm always like, like whatever your, your like non- craft job was if you worked at you know wherever whatever part-time job you had what you're getting paid there add 20 percent and then start there uh add 10 percent, whatever make more than you would be making doing your other job for the same amount of money um because if you're making a dollar more doing your art than you were flipping burgers you're going to be a little bit happier and you're still making about the same amount of money but you're like what how could you survive on that money? You're already surviving on minimum wage. Um, what is minimum wage now? The people, what is it? 
Still well. 725 across the country. Yeah, so like, <laughs> you have so like, I would love to get $12 an hour. I'd love to get $10 an hour. Just like, ask for it. And like, you don't, it's not being arrogant at all, but like already just increase your own value. Um, and then as far as when you do it again, like, I don't know, once a year, reevaluate what you've done and then you can charge a little bit more. Good clients will recognize that and respect it. And you will also get feedback from clients. Ultimately, when you submit an estimate, you might hear, oh, well, yeah, I'm going to use you. You're a great value, which maybe tells you that you're undercharging. <laughs> or if their feedback is, oh, I just can't afford you, then maybe you're overcharging. It could be an issue of expectations, but you will get that feedback from them, even if they aren't saying specifically, you are charging too much. I think a good thing too is to um, segment out the estimate um, so that the client knows where that money is going uh, to be like, oh, well, you know, branding, branding is going to cost this, uh, certain like one direction costs this, two directions this, uh, packaging is this, and then even like production files is this. And that way they know where the money's going. Maybe even you could section out the time so they know what, how much time is going into it. Uh, so that'll really help instead of just throwing a number out there because they really, they really don't have a gauge as mm -hmm. to what that number is going towards. So I think that'll help out a lot. Yeah, that's a good, that's good advice. Yeah, good. You have anything to add, Eric? No, I think everybody you know. <laughs> got it. <laughs> Just want to check, um, Carolyn? You might know for sure, but I feel like AIGA has a pretty good salary database, and I think it includes people who do freelance work. So that's another good resource to look at. Yeah, I think they do, if not annual, um, a, every other year, a salary survey, and they have good data on what people are making because regionally it's different as well. But yes, AIGA, again, has good resources. Yeah, and you, a lot of those resources you don't have to be a member to access, so they're useful. Yeah, um, sorry, they just, I, I'll send a link, but there's one um, for Nice Moves is a Minnesota sort of motion graphics animation community. We have a salary survey for at least the Midwest to get a sense for that. And for anyone that's doing animation, storyboards or anything like that, just look at the uh, animators union in LA, they publish theirs weekly rates for different jobs. It's a good starting point. You, you can make charge less in the Midwest, but at least it gives you an idea of what the average pay is for things. Um, it's probably the closest thing to like an AIGA for animation, um, games, things like that. I'll try to send a link too, sorry. Um, we have a question from Lauren. Uh, do you recommend starting with a full-time job before moving into freelance or just jumping right in? <laughs> <laughs> I have a, an opinion about that. I would say yes. There's so much to learn and the stakes are pretty high just to start out freelance from the get-go. There's so much to learn about estimating and preparing files for printers and managing projects and talking to clients. And those are great things to learn while you're working for somebody else and they're paying you to learn. <laughs> so I think I worked for somebody, for other people for nine years. And I think for at least five of those, I wouldn't have been ready to do freelance work. Yeah, I can agree 100%. Uh, I, uh, when I made the jump, I was even nervous that I hadn't worked enough. Um, I worked in the industry for maybe around five years, and I was like, am I going too fast? Like, should I maybe work another three, four years before doing it? Uh, and luckily enough, I had enough um, of a client base to actually do the jump. But yeah, without those five years of industry experience, I would not be even anywhere close to this point. Um, I can go. I also definitely agree. Um, I think it also helps to have something that is flexible. Um, so maybe if you can kind of gauge the flexibility of your potential new job or career, um, you don't want to be stuck not being able to flex and do freelance stuff. 
Um, so if you have the option to be more flexible, I think obviously take it. Um, that definitely helps to um, have time to spend on freelance stuff, whether it's nights and weekends, or if you can even get days off to do a day shoot or whatever here and there, it's all extremely helpful. As long as you can schedule, that's the thing is like, you be that flexible and like, cause I, um, I have done it and I have people that do, well, they'll get a job that they'll work, you know, 10, 12 hours a week, but at least they know that they can count on that money and plan on that money, but they don't take up all their time. It's not a job that takes their life. So they can do freelance. Um, but having, having any experience of being in a production and seeing how the machine works and so that you can learn how you fit into the production. Cause it's, you know, to, you're always going to be a in some sort of collaborative situation, even if it's just you and client or you client agency and then General Mills or something. There's a lot of voices that come in there, but knowing how the machine works and where things are needed, where how to communicate between those, um, between the levels of the hierarchy, whatever it might be. Um, so having a, some job experience can help you find out your place in it all and then you can step back and manage how you navigate through that. Um, Kevin on Facebook asks, what piece of kit have you gotten the most value out of for your creative work from home? Is proofing equipment worth it? Very specific question. <laughs> <laughs> What does he mean specifically by proofing equipment? Does this mean soundproofing? That's probably not it. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> There's a little bit of a lag between here and Facebook, so. <laughs> we'll come back to that question, Kevin. Um, how do you handle nightmare clients? Uh, charge them a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's, I mean, you have to be in the right spot of your career to do that. Um, but, you know, you still have to be patient. Like, even if they're the worst people in the world, um, it's still a small world and word spread. So if you're the professional in the situation and they're a nightmare, you win. Um, so don't get angry. Just sort of like find your best way out of it so everyone's happy. You can move on. Um, but don't be the aggressor in the situation. Um, they could have just had a bad burrito that day uh, and been in a bad mood. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. F finish the project, send them an invoice. And the beauty about being a freelancer is that you never have to work with them again. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And if someone is like you're, you get the experience where you're like, they're starting to smell like a, a nightmare client then you just charge like triple rates because worst case scenario, they want you to do it. Like, I'll, can I suffer through that for three months and get triple my rate? Maybe I can. You'll learn that by, you know, you have to deal with, but it's okay because like that'll scare people away faster than anything. And worst case scenario, you make a bunch of money. <laughs> I think one nightmare client that I've had kind of recurring in all of my different um, things is the one that, wants endless revisions, which I think is kind of applicable to anybody and everybody. There's always going to be that person that wants six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 revisions. Um, so I think having kind of going back to that strong contract, having that, you know, outlined ahead of time that you're only going to do X revisions and give them kind of a time frame for those revisions is I've found to be super, super helpful to eliminate and, you know, get them to think about very strongly about that first revision period. And they're not like, yeah, seven, eight, nine revisions down the road and you're two months into editing and you're just checked out. So I think yeah, having a strong contract helps with that. hundred percent agree of defining the revision process. Um, cause it focuses them cause as you get run into a lot of, I'll know it when I see it clients and you will burn yourself to the ground real quick. Um, if you focus them by saying you get two revisions, if they want more, fine, I'll do it. I'll charge you a day rate for that extra day. Um, just quantify everything and be very cool about it. Um, but yeah, you sort of lay out those terms as quickly as possible. Um, it, it, it'll manage your time way better. That's good advice. 
Okay, so we've got clarification from Kevin. So it's a two part question. What is the most useful piece of equipment that you have? And is something like proofing for print, pre media, um, is that worth it? That's very graphic design print focused. But what is your useful piece of equipment? I think ultimately you will also be working with a print vendor. And when it comes to providing precise color proofs, you'll want to work with your print vendor on that as well, because they're going to have their proofs calibrated to their presses. Uh, so I have a color correct monitor here, but not a color booth. And if retouching is needed or color correction that is that precise, I usually have a printer involved. So I don't have that super calibrated equipment here, no. I think for any digital media, um, good storage is like the utmost important thing that you can have. It protects your butt and it's just good. Um, don't have a hard drive banging around in your backpack. That's your master backup. Like have one, you know, at work that you bring home once a month that has, you know, stuff that you, you would die if you lost it um, and have a good, like a NAS type, drive at home. Um, yeah, just good storage is crucial in my opinion. Yeah, we just use like the, uh, the Google suite um, where we can hook to our desktop, our Google Drive. So we work off of that and it, it's automatically saving into on the cloud as well. Um, and it helps work between, even though we're, my Wendy's right across, you know, right next to me, two feet away, we can share files. Um, but we always know it's there, but I, we also each have a giant terabyte storage off to the side and do our cleanups and, and backups of things. Um, yeah, that's your, that's your commodity. That's your livelihood. So take care of it because clients will come back to you and like, you know, do you want to rebuild something that you, this trash because it was taking up space on your desktop? Uh, no, you want to be able to, that makes you a good freelancer. It's like you have all that stuff ready. They want to like, we're going to change the blue to more of an aqua blue. And then you could do that across the board of branding um, because you have good backed up organized files. As a case in point in that, just yesterday I had a client ask me for files from 2013 and 2014, which I was able to retrieve just fine. Um, but yeah, clients are going to ask for that kind of yeah. stuff. And you can charge for that too. Yes. Yep. That, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> That's the thing is the ownership of files. I don't know if people like what, I'm curious to hear how other people on this panel are approaching that is um, you run into clients that like you do all the work for them. They also want all of your working files. Um, if so, charge them for that because they could take those working files and hire another person to do the work for cheaper. Um, so like you, what you, your deliverables are, are that final thing. If it's ready for print, if it's ready for broadcast, whatever it might be, but all of the things that you took to build it are yours. You own that. People can buy it because if a company wants to have, you know, someone big like General Mills or Best Buy or somebody wants to own all that, fine. It's in the contract, they can buy it. There's a price for that. Right. Um, it's like you, you, if you built anything, if you were a carpenter and you built a bookshelf, um, you know, you're giving away that thing that you built. Um, they like also want your plans and all your tools. <laughs> you know, give me your your hammer and your saw and all of your blueprints as well for the nope. same price. Nope. You don't do that. <laughs> um, we, so we have time for just a f probably two, one big question, a little small one at the end. Um, Kevin does say thank you for going into cloud storage. So he was going to ask about that. <laughs> um, so how much of your time do you spend um, to marketing and finding new clients and how much is actually working on projects? That's a delicate balance. I mean, obviously like some months are going to be slower than others. So those slow months, those, that marketing time goes way up and the busier months that marketing time goes way down. I guess it really just depends on how your workflow goes. But if you're just starting out, I'd say like that marketing time should be a little higher uh, just to get the word out there, you know, get on like dribble, Behance, uh, get your portfolio website, you know, in tip top shape. 
uh, you know, any other like, you know, Instagram, like other Twitter, like medias that you can really push towards. Uh, but let's say like a more neutral kind of month would be like, uh, for me, it's maybe about 80% work and about 20% marketing. I feel like I'm doing it both all of the time a little bit. Um, I think it comes down to, um, cause like all of it's almost all of it's social media for me and like maintaining relationships versus like putting a billboard of Mike's freelance animation. Like that's just not what I do um, to advertise. It's relationship um, building and maintaining. Um, if you're using social media as your way to get the work, um, curate that like you do anything like you do your business card like you do like you know have a good front don't be sloppy about it um and you know either that i like set aside an hour a week where i know i'm going to post something new that we're doing um a new project some things you can't post until the client says it's cool until it's out in the world that's fine people love looking at work in progress people like looking at your inspiration just uh to see that you're constantly producing um, it can be as simple as that, but just set aside the time like anything else for yourself. And am I schedule uh, marketing? Cause I have, I'm doing it. I'm always hustling, but I'm also also doing the production. I'll work for chunks of three hours. I'll market for an hour. Uh, I'll nap for an hour. Uh, I'll play with my dog for an hour. Then I'll come back and work for three hours. Um, just have these chunks of time dedicated to tasks that you need to do. Eric, do you have anything to add? I think everybody, again, pretty much nailed that. Um, like I said, kind of in the beginning, I have a full-time job working 40 hours a week. Um, so most of my freelance time goes pretty much specifically to work. Um, I do think it's super important to have a strong website with a quick and easy way to have, you know, contact you, kind of a set it and forget it type situation um and then do i do just kind of basic maintenance on social media and that's pretty much it word of mouth is huge for me on a personal level um and so one last question before we wrap up here if uh we were to walk away kind of learning one thing tonight what would you want people to remember and we'll start with, who do I want to put on the spot? Um, I mean, Eric, you're right here, so you can go first. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I had three bullet points for this one. I think one of them we kind of hit on earlier pretty well, and that's finding a good way to separate work from home, um, which I imagine people can that have joined in on Facebook or whatever can kind of rewatch that section of it. Um, I also had find what you're good at and focus on that if you're – spending a lot of time doing stuff that you don't like or aren't good at. Obviously sometimes that stuff pays the bills, so it's hard to ignore, but as you progress, try to kind of hone your skills and I think you'll get much more enjoyment out of being able to do what you love most. Um, and then another thing that we hit on earlier is just kind of telling anyone who will listen to you talk about what you do. Um, any situation that you can bring up, hey, I'm a freelancer, I do this. Um, don't, you know, shove it in their face or anything and say, do you need graphic design work? You know, just kind of talk about what you do and they'll either have a project for you in mind or they'll keep it in the back of their mind when they do. So. Uh, Carolyn, do you want to go? Sure. So there are, I'll share a piece of advice that I got when I first started out and then I'll share a piece of advice for going forward. So one thing that I heard when I first started freelancing was keep your finances in order and expect a tax audit. And I've been audited twice. They are not fun, um, but both went pretty well because I keep my finances in order. So that was the best thing I heard right when I started freelancing. And then as far as advice going forward, I would just say with COVID-19, we are in a crazy upside down world right now. And as a new grad, 
understand this is not normal and it's going to be months before life gets back to normal. So this summer, maybe pick a skill or two that you're really interested in and spend time learning and developing that skill. So that way, if it's many months before people are hiring full-time workers, you can go in and say, I graduated and in the interim, I've learned Figma and, or I've taken an online class on project management or I've done whatever it is that is interesting. So then you can demonstrate to a future employer, you didn't just wait, that you took action on something during this crazy upside down time. Yeah, I think uh, Carolyn nailed that. Uh, yeah, it's crazy world out there right now and having you know, uh, a skill or two outside of design, I think is gonna be very uh, beneficial for the next few months. Um, you know, like, uh, yeah, any, like Figma, photography, like anything, uh, I think Project Manager is a great one. Um, I know there's a lot of people out there looking for uh, uh, even like uh, technicians now, so something like that would be good. Uh, but in terms of advice for uh, the freelance panel, um, my number one bit of advice is a communication. Um, some of my uh, word of mouth clients, um, they mentioned foremost my communication skills with them uh, in terms of emails. Uh, I tend to answer emails within 24 hours because there's nothing worse than if you're gonna like reach out to somebody and they don't get back to you for you know, a week or so. Like you're, not, you're probably not gonna work with them. So I would say be astute with your communication uh, even if it's just like a simple reply, at least that gives them validation that you, you've heard them. So I think communication is very important and underlooked in some instances. And Mike, anything from you? Uh, yeah, I mean, all that, everything that was said so far on the panel, uh, I support completely. Um, I would also say, especially if you're just getting into this field, is to make stuff right now. Um, cause you can't, don't wait for someone to give you the permission to make stuff. Uh, you have a time right now and kind of resources to make it. Um, we're doing a lot of like group projects through using a discord channel. Um, just keeping your skills up and learning to collaborate, even like, especially even this remote way, cause it might be how we have to do it for a while. Um, but also if you decide like, I've always wanted to really do a cat animation, uh, because I really like cats. And then suddenly a client like, says, we're doing something about cats. Do you have that? And you're like, yeah, of course I have this. <laughs> or I've done something that's not necessarily about cats, but I think it could fit or whatever. But that showing that you're productive is pretty good. And we're kind of like in this weird murky, uh, things could go in a thousand different ways. We're all kind of holding our breath right now. It's kind of, strangely enough, a perfect time to absorb some new knowledge. It's we're in a time where all those resources are available and it's like, oh, I'd love to learn how to do Blender, but I just don't have the time. Well, now you do. <laughs> uh, so do it and just build up your own skills. And worst case scenario, again, um, you'll have a better portfolio and you have made something. <laughs> Good. Yeah. They are still all in school. Um, they, still have, they still have classes. But, um, well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, if you want to look up any of our panelists, their websites are easy to find as freelancers. You just search their name and design, and it pretty much will take you there. Um, so thank you again for joining us. Thank you to our panelists, um, and have a wonderful evening.